Hey guys, this is your host Kubi, and welcome to the Toon Balloon Podcast, our outlet to discuss, theorize, and enjoy our favorite webtoons with the occasional anime and manga sprinkled in between. So today's episode is going to be called Confrontation. This is because the webtoons we will be discussing today involve a lot of confrontation between characters and a character's own thoughts. Now, here is a list of the webtoons we will be discussing today. We got Unordinary, Lore Olympus, The Fate of a Rose, Just a Dream, and The Remarried Empress. Now, I will leave timestamps for each webtoon discussed in this episode, so that way you can just go straight to the one that you want to listen to the most. Now, let's jump into the webtoons. We have Unordinary, episode 214. I'm going to summarize it a little bit and then we'll jump into the discussion. We start the episode off with Serafina and Lila continuing their meeting that they had in that cafe. We get a little bit of backstory of Lila leaving Serafina's family and essentially is showing that Serafina does feel a little resentful of her sister. Serafina is contemplating whether or not to trust her sister Lila and right when she's about to discuss her feelings with her, we get a sudden ominous flash, which happens to be the power dampener. Lila makes a call and it looks like that she has been followed by the enemy. Lila, Arlo, and Serafina all decide to escape through the back way of the cafe when they suddenly get ambushed by a group of people. Arlo decides to defend himself with his barrier ability. Lila mentions to him the issue with his ability now is that it could have been dropped by half due to the power dampener. The episode ends off with the three of them surrounded by the enemy and Arlo is doing his best to cover for them with his barrier ability. Now this episode felt like a very dynamic episode. I really appreciate the work that Uruchan puts into her work and chapters because when you read the episode, it just feels like it flows and it doesn't exactly um, take it slow. This episode felt so quick and when we got to the cliffhanger, I was devastated, <laughs> but I was so excited because I knew the next episode was going to be awesome. Considering how this episode had ended, we are obviously going to have a confrontation with the enemy that we have been waiting to see for quite a while. We as the fans kind of already know that Arlo's aunt is suspected to be Vulcan. I don't think that there's going to be that confrontation where he sees that his aunt is indeed Vulcan but we will have a confrontation with the enemy and who it is that Lila is trying to, you know, defend against. Lila has revealed that she is indeed creating some sort of ability dampener, but that it seems that whoever has their hands on it is attacking high tiers, such as Serafina. Now, Lila also made it clear that she did not want Serafina targeted and she told that to her superiors. Now, they did this without her wishes, so Serafina has become a victim to whatever it is that Lila is working for. It definitely feels like Lila has gone rogue, because whoever it is that she is running away from in order to help Serafina is bad news. I am really curious on where this is going to go, because honestly, this is one of those types of stories that have me bamboozled, and I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> like... I get really excited reading new episodes of Unordinary because I don't know what is to come. This story can be very unpredictable and I do worry that a couple of our favorite characters will get targeted next with the dampener. It could be Remy, it could be Blyke, it could be John for that matter. Nobody seems safe right now. It's been established within this story that there is this hierarchy between the powerful and the weak. We have characters who have tried to become superheroes and have failed, sadly, such as Remy's brother. I feel like we haven't gotten to the meat of the story. We are just at the beginning layer. There is so much more to come because right now we are only in a high school setting. This story is going to go beyond that and it's not going to be just the hierarchy within the school system, but within their own society. Their society is beyond belief. I mean, we have people who just get beat up because they're weak. I know Uruchan says that her biggest inspiration for writing her stories 
is what she sees around her in life. The students are going to become more involved with the outside world and understand the importance of helping others and becoming real superheroes. I don't think that they are just going to become legitimate superheroes wearing capes and such like what Remy and Blyke are kind of doing already, but the students are going to become pinnacles of change. And even though it feels light years away and almost impossible right now, I do find that we will be able to have John and Serafina reconcile and they will be the pinnacles of change that I had mentioned. It's going to take a lot of character development, a lot of time, and a lot of confrontation because I feel like that's what Serafina and John are inevitably going to have to do is fight it out. These two were made our main characters for a reason. I am curious on what scenes we are going to get in the next episode. I'm suspecting some fighting. They will be outnumbered greatly because of what we have seen from the ending of this chapter. I hope that Serafina doesn't get hurt. I hate seeing her get hurt. She's so sweet. I really hope that she can get her time travel ability again because I feel like we didn't get much of a glimpse of her in the beginning since her powers have been gone for so long. I'm really excited to see what Lila's ability is. I'm assuming it's time travel as well, but it might be a different extent. Maybe there's a bit of spice to it. I am also expecting some sort of confrontation between the two sisters so we can understand what it is that Lila is trying to do with her new profession and why did she leave the family. I can make a couple of guesses since Serafina has given us clues in the past when she was, um, I guess, in lockdown after her whole incident reading the Unordinary book. Seems her parents are very overbearing. They were quite overbearing over Serafina. I also think they probably don't understand what it is that Lila probably wants to fight against. I'm looking forward to the next chapter of An Ordinary. Hopefully we'll get a couple of answers and maybe some cool action scenes. We'll see. Next, we have Lore Olympus, episode 140, Pretzel by Rachel Smythe. Here is a mini recap. The episode starts off with Daphne and Thanatos hanging out after her awful date with Apollo. She is just mentioning her disappointment within Apollo and her infatuations with him, along with the strategies that she would take to grab his attention, which she thinks was pathetic of her since she felt that Apollo was just using her. She mentions that Apollo is a little obsessed with Persephone, and that's an understatement. Thanatos offers some words of wisdom, along with attempting to trash Persephone. That conversation falls flat since Daphne refuses to join in on this negative talk of Persephone. Daphne touches on the fact of why it is that Thanatos is so bothered by Persephone. Despite Thanatos' confusion to that question, Daphne offers her phone number to him and says that he can call her anytime after he decides to get himself together. The next scene has Persephone receiving a phone from Hades. At first, she is a little reluctant to take the phone without paying him back and he tells her that there is no need because it is literal garbage. And the last scene that we have is of Hera and Echo doing some recon at the old motel that Persephone was hiding in after the incident with Apollo. This chapter just reveals one of my new favorite characters and that is Daphne. She has a lot of spunk and I really appreciate that she is very confident and secure in herself. Daphne refuses to let Thanatos trash on Persephone because that wasn't the point of their conversation. I like that she tries to talk to him and tell him why it is that it was so important to him for the favoritism that Persephone gets from Hades. In reality, I think he was just so used to trashing on people because of his relationships with Minth and Thetis. They used to have a group chat where they would just discuss dirt on everyone they knew. And my heart hurt a little when I noticed that Thanatos suspected Daphne might break his phone. My guess is that Minth must have broken it in the past. Daphne is a good parallel to his toxic friend. She's secure, she's confident, she really respects other women, and she's not trying to trash on other people. She's just trying to do her own thing. For Thanatos to be so bothered by little things like that, 
It does set a precedent that he has a lot of growth to do. It's really cool of Daphne to offer her time to somebody when she thinks that they have a lot of potential of growth. I can see that Daphne sees a lot of good in people, and that might be why she didn't listen to the rumors and things about Apollo when she decided to date him. Because I'm sure that a lot of people had mentioned, like her friend, her roommate Echo, telling her that he was bad news. Daphne wasn't the type to listen to rumors because she wanted to trust her gut and to see the person for herself. I find that she is a very compelling character and I can't wait to see more of her in the future. Thanatos looks like he's on his way to the redemption arc and I wonder what it's going to take of him to get there, to get to that good spot in his life so that he can finally connect with Daphne. More than likely, he's going to have to drop his friends, which are Minth and Thetis. It seems that he just might need to understand his role in everything because he does seem like a very sweet guy and that he just tries to please people. He just needs to find security within himself. He doesn't need people to tell him what he should or shouldn't be because he can be anything that he wants by himself. We have the following scenes with Persephone and Hades and I love the color scheme that Persephone is wearing now. She's wearing more green, more color. She used to wear a lot of white. I feel like Persephone is just embracing herself a bit more. And I think the wardrobe change is just the start of Persephone understanding a bit more of who she is. And even though she is understanding more of her own character, she still keeps that humbleness to her. She doesn't want to take something from Hades and feel like she's taking advantage of him because in no way is she doing that. She offers to pay him back for that phone. Hades insists that she just takes it because it is just literal garbage. <laughs> they have the cutest scenes together and I can't wait to see more of them in the future. We then see Hera and Echo investigating that motel that Persephone used to hide in after that whole incident with Apollo. I noticed that Hera is questioning where the heck did Persephone hide all of her belongings. I don't think Hera was too aware that Persephone didn't have a lot to begin with. And she did seem a little close-minded, but I also think it was supposed to be a joke <laughs> with the dynamic between her and Echo. Echo's face the entire time just looks like she's so done. <laughs> but just understanding that Persephone was probably going through a rough time. I do like their character dynamic. Echo and Hera have such good personalities that just mesh really well. They both feel like very confident women, but it also feels like it's a very good understanding and respectful relationship. It is professional, but I also find that it could be a good gateway to Hera finding a really good friend. They seem to be searching for that SIM card that Persephone mentioned had all the photos. I'm worried that it might not be there because it has the likelihood of disappearing. And if it isn't there, I just don't know who on earth could even snatch it before Hera and Echo could. Looks like we'll see in the next episode of Lore Olympus. Okay, so we are going to talk about The Fate of a Rose by Sushi Cat Go, episode 42. The chapter starts off with Akita running around looking for the thief of her purse. Akita tries to look on the bright side, but unfortunately, her negative feelings start to loom in. We start noticing that Akita is suffering from a panic attack and that an anti-Akita is trying to lure Akita into these negative emotions. Just when anti-Akita is getting her way, Xander comes right in at the perfect time with these bandages that I think he's been holding on to for three episodes already and snaps her out of it. She decides to embrace Xander because she needed the comfort and she apologizes since she knows how he feels about her. Akita tells Xander that someone stole her purse and her coat and right when he finds out his eyes turn bright red. This episode was drawn so beautifully by Sushi Cat Go. I love the dynamics and the beautiful effects that she added onto those uh, scenes with Akita suffering from the panic attack. I saw many previews on her stories on Instagram and I was so excited to see what was going to unveil and I was not disappointed whatsoever. The way that Akita was panicking really broke my heart because I can tell that she's carrying a lot of weight on her shoulders. I'm still unclear of her backstory, but I'm sure that we will get that uncovered in later episodes. Akita is suffering from 
her own inner voice attacking her, which is something I can relate to myself. I feel like it is hard to fight off negative thoughts. I can definitely relate to these thoughts being overwhelming and so powerful. It just feels like you're drowning. I appreciate how much the author portrays mental health in this comic. It's very sensitive, but also very realistic. Also, if you do not follow the author on Instagram, I definitely recommend that you do because the memes are top tier. <laughs> I'm so glad that Xander finally got to Akita to give her these darn bandages that he's been carrying for the last three episodes. <laughs> He didn't exactly heal any wounds, but he did at least give Akita some sort of comfort. Xander still ended up playing a big role in Akita's healing. Not that you can really heal a period per se, but in this case, he did his best. And we're going to give him a pat on the back for it anyways. <laughs> I noticed glimpses in Akita's flashbacks, and it looked like it was Amy's parents. Anti-Akita mentioned that Akita was trying to hide from them and that they might have found her already. So I'm really curious as to what this incident caused for Akita to be running away from a group of, not a group, but a pair of people, a pair of powerful people. And what is it exactly that Auntie Akita was saying that could actually help her in this situation? It didn't seem like a good thing, though. It seemed very devious. It could be the necklace, but I don't know. I also don't know how powerful this necklace is. It feels like it's giving Akita superpowers because it seems that everyone is so desperately looking for this thing. Auntie Akita has a lot of personality to her. I really like this take of the inner thoughts becoming its own being. She's very sassy, but at the same time, I could tell that she was very mischievous and devious. Not a good thing, of course, but I like that characteristic. And the looks that she'd give Xander whenever he'd finally come in was so funny to me because she just looks so done with him. <laughs> when Akita apologized to Xander over hugging him, I was a little worried that this was a red flag. I feel like this won't be the first time we're going to see her asking for him for comfort. We might end up with a couple misunderstandings of Xander feeling like he's being taken advantage of. Also, Xander's eyes were red. Red alert. <laughs> I am very curious of what he's planning to do. I don't know if he's going to find the culprit, but we'll see you soon enough in the next episode. <laughs> So this segment is going to be a little short since the episode wasn't too long. We are going to talk about Just a Dream, episode 56 by Hazelnut. This episode starts off with Lisa pointing out that she knows the substitute teacher. He is the guy that took the unsolicited photo of her at the convenience store in the last episode. Mary Chris, Blake, and... Lisa all go to eat lunch and that's when the substitute teacher comes by to ask Lisa if he could talk to her in private. Luke ends up finally getting to the table and notices that Lisa is gone. The episode ends with the substitute teacher apologizing to Lisa for his actions. I don't know what the teacher's excuse is for taking the unsolicited photo of Lisa. Whether she was a minor or not, I don't think it's okay to take pictures of people while they're just standing in a convenience store, without their consent, mind you. Not to mention that her picture was posted on a blog saying that she was a beauty, which is a little creepy if you ask me. So as suspicious as I am of this character, I am curious of what this excuse could even be, because what on earth could this guy even say to try to apologize for what he did? And considering the arc of where this story is going, I'm really hoping that this will be the Luke and Lisa arc so my ship can finally sail. I definitely see development happening because we already see a lot of development with Mary, Chris, and Blake and that Luke has finally moved on. I would really be excited to see Lisa and Luke finally get together or at least realize their feelings for one another. So I am so excited for the next episode. Hopefully we can get a lot more development and see where this goes. The 
lastly, we are going to talk about The Remarried Empress by Alpha Tart and Sumpol. Episode 42. The episode starts off with Navier thinking about the discussion she had with the Emperor in the last episode. She's worried about the possibility of having to adopt this child that is the Emperor's and Trashta's baby. She also thinks that she would never love this baby considering the way that this child will be raised by Rashta. Eventually, her thoughts get interrupted and she goes meets up with the Grand Duke Kaufman. The Grand Duke is very much in love with uh, Navier still because of the love potion. He is quite confused as to why this love potion is so powerful considering he has made several before that weren't this intense. He informs Navier that he has to leave to his country now due to the fact that the Emperor will probably not give the consent to trading with both of their lands. He asks Navier if she will leave with him to his own country. She denies his request, and as sad as he is, he at least asks her for a hug, and it is a very sweet embrace, which leads to the Grand Duke Kaufman's leave. The next scene involves Navier reconciling with her brother Corsair. They mention that there are tears on her shoulders, and that whenever she's trying on all the new gifts that he bought her, he notices there is a date circled on her calendar which is the celebration of the mistress's baby, which you could tell by the ominous tone of the next panel. He does not look happy. I am so bummed that the Grand Duke had to leave because he was one of my favorite characters out of this story. He had really good comedic timing and the man did the Lord's work. <laughs> when he punched the emperor back in episode 38, I was so happy. <laughs> because someone needed to put that guy in his place. I'm not very sure if this love potion will ever go away, and like the Grand Duke had mentioned, he's not even sure the effects will ever go away after the love potion wears off, because he even suspected that he could still be in love with her in the end. He's such a sweet little character, and every time he looks at the Empress and he just tears up a little just by how beautiful she is, it just warms my heart because I feel like Navier just really deserves that feeling. She's just so unaware of anyone ever feeling that way for her. And to see someone just be so expressive with her about their feelings towards her, it's just so comforting to see. Navier deserves it all. I mean, she is our empress. She works so hard in her position and she does it well. When the Grand Duke mentioned that he had to leave, and that the trade offers were off, she was so upset because she did all the work. I mean, without the Emperor's consent, none of this was going to happen. And it's so upsetting because she really is the backbone of their kingdom. The Emperor just has no idea what he's missing out on. And he's just a huge idiot. I mean, the guy is just so blind to everything and kind of expects everyone to just let him walk all over them, which is ridiculous. The guy is just so entitled. I am really looking forward to this new character, which is Navier's brother, Cosser. I think that's how you say his name. I hope I'm not butchering it. I love the big brother dynamic, or maybe it's younger brother. I'm not too sure. But he seems very protective of Navier. And I can't wait to see a family member of hers come in and tell the emperor how he feels. In the last episode, whenever they mentioned that he might be coming back, um, the emperor did seem a little hesitant about it. So I know something juicy is going to come up and I'm ready for it. I want to see this brother come in and probably smack him around a little bit or something. <laughs> I'm just ready for that divorce episode. Then again, I think everybody is ready for that divorce episode. My friend will sometimes message me on Instagram and she'll just tell me I'm just ready for it because we both can't stand the emperor. <laughs> but we'll see what happens in the next installment. All right, so that looks like the last of all the webtoons we are going to talk about today. Let me know your thoughts or opinions of any of the webtoons we discussed today by messaging me through either of my social media handles. My Twitter handle is gr 2 and Cheddar, and my Instagram is insert underscore gooby underscore here. I would love to hear from you. Also, definitely tell me any other comics, anime, or manga you are interested in. I may talk about them in future episodes. You can now listen to the Toon Balloon podcast on SoundCloud, Spotify, and Google Play Podcasts. Now, let's end this podcast episode.
Thank you so much for joining me today and taking the time to listen to my humble podcast. I look forward to talking to you again. This is the Toon Balloon Podcast. I was your host, Gooby. See you next time.